On Tech News Today, Lindsay Turntine is our co-anchor. We interview Reuters reporter Deepa Sattaraman and Wall Street Journal writer Danny Yadrin. We'll tell you about Amazon's new payment system, plus a new report that says cybercrime is super expensive. Apple's going to make iPhones harder to track, and Microsoft might build something like Connect into their phones. Wow, all that and more coming up right now. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, June 9th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Citrix ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with Citrix ShareFile. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com, click the microphone, and enter TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. And I'm Jason Howell. Tech News Today explores the big stories of the day with some of the world's best journalists. Our guest co-anchor today is Lindsay Turrentine. Lindsay is editor-in-chief for CNET Reviews. Welcome, Lindsay Turrentine. Hi. So before the show, we were talking about how awesome the artwork is behind you. And you yeah. said most of it produced by your own children. Most of it produced by my own children quite some time ago, um, except for the Rothko print right there. But you, they're kind of indistinguishable from each other. <laughs> it, it, was, it was produced a long time ago, but it still holds up. Really, yeah. really nice work. Thank you. Well, speaking of things that still hold up, today is Donald Duck Day. That's right. Donald Duck is 80 years old and still doesn't wear pants. Yeah. You think right. he'd learn by now. Yeah, I know. Well, or maybe he's got something to teach the rest of us. I mean, if you can see, apparently he's not. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, see, no pants. I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't know what video you put in there, and this is uh, perfectly is that? appropriate. That is <laughs> Donald Duck's butt. I believe. Duck butt. I believe it is, yeah. Well-coffed. Yeah, with a hat on it. There we okay, go. All right. There you go. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, I can't find a tech angle there. There's just nothing there. Just a uh, big fan of Donald Duck and Scrooge McDuck, uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> well, Lindsay, we, I better get myself out of hot water here and yes. get into news. <laughs> Amazon, is it. Amazon is launching a payment service today for subscriptions and recurring payments of any kind. Deepa Sitharaman covers e-commerce for Reuters, and she's here to tell us all about it. Welcome, Deepa. Hey, thank you for having me. Glad you're here. She's uh, joining us by phone. This new service puts Amazon into some pretty wild competition, uh, including with eBay's PayPal, Braintree, Google Wallet, Stripe, other companies. Mm -hmm. Why would Amazon want to get into this particular business? So payments is an area where Amazon has been experimenting, exploring for quite some time. You have kind of a natural advantage given how many credit cards they have on file. I think with the recurring payments, it naturally extends um, a role that Amazon has played for a while as a middleman. You know, if they already work with third-party vendors all over the world, you can buy buy those items on the website, and this just extends that. It's a pretty profitable business for them. This is a global service, or this, or U.S. only? Uh, for now, it's U.S. only, is my understanding, and then um, you can imagine that. You know, as Amazon grows, it'll extend it extend beyond that. North America only, sorry, but um, you know, it's hard not to imagine that it'll it'll extend and expand beyond this. Deepa, do you think it's it's Amazon's goal to be associated with all retail eventually? Right, like when you're buying something, Amazon is part of that transaction, no matter what. Um. It depends on how broad of a definition you have of retail. I mean, absolutely, I think. They want to shape the way we Americans, we people, everybody in the world buys and, and sells and services and goods and all kinds of things. I think their ambitions are pretty broad. I think that's fair to say and potentially even conservative. One of the factors that uh, is in play here is the number of credit cards that Amazon has on file. Active credit cards are actually hard to come by, and co uh, companies compete with each other to see how many they, they can come up with. Apple, for example, is probably the global leader with uh, something like 800 million active credit cards on file. Amazon is way up there. But right. how does this compare to other services that they're going to be competing with? That, I assume that Amazon has way more credit cards on file than Google, for example. I, I think that's a fair assumption. I think that's right. The problem with Amazon, of course, and you'll hear you'll see this in analyst notes, uh, is that it, they compete with their sellers. And I think that has kind of held them back in in payments because sellers, third-party merchants, startups, 
they don't necessarily want to compete with Amazon down the line. I see. And and as uh, as we pointed out earlier, this is for subscriptions and recurring payments. So you basically sign up, and then the payments come automatically. I would imagine they would use this for subscription. They already sell subscriptions to electronic, you know, magazines, and newspapers, and stuff like that. Uh, or are they already doing that with uh, with some other service? So they have, if, if you know, they they do provide subscriptions for their own kind of products. Um, including the magazines, including um, including uh, you know, periodicals or other sort of regular payments, but, but that's through the Amazon platform. This represents the first time that third parties could, could tap into that service. So, um, you know, phone bills or, you know, grocery delivery or anything, online video subscription, any kind of third party that has a service like that, this this would work for, and, you know, the amount could change every month too, as it does with the phone bill. Do you think that Amazon Prime, that Amazon's experience with Prime is going to help them do this better than other services? I mean, I've noticed I'm a Prime subscriber and my, the credit card associated with my Prime account timed out and Amazon very kind of seamlessly set, sent me an email that said, hey, um, we noticed that this, this credit card is no longer valid, but you have another one on file that you use for Amazon. We're just going to switch it to that unless you tell us not to. That seemed pretty sophisticated to me. Do you think that's where all their experience comes from? I think that's how they get some of the most attractive customers for retailers in general. You'll talk to Ting, and, and Ting says that the uh, group of consumers that used and tested the Amazon recurring payments service uh, spent 30% more than their average customer. So I think Prime attracts a certain type of customer who spends a lot, who spends, um, and, and who's very attractive to retailers overall. And this helps those startups, those companies tap into that. One of Amazon's uh, biggest assets is their homepage. They, when they want to sell something big time, they just throw it at the top of their homepage. For example, they, when they came out the Kindle Reader, I think for the first year, the t front and center thing on their Amazon.com homepage was the Kindle Reader, and they were selling it pretty hard. Right now, I was shocked this morning to see that they are actually pitching invitations to their upcoming event uh, on uh -huh. uh, on the 18th on the homepage to the public. I mean, it was kind of shocking uh, to me that they would be inviting. I assume it was the public. Maybe they know that I go to those kinds of events professionally. But um, I can imagine also that they could have a promotional element to this. For example, they could have big-level customers selling subscriptions to things, and they could sell those as well. Have they announced anything like that, a sort of an arrangement that includes marketing? Through the subscription payments service uh, launched today? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, no, they, they haven't. I mean, they, they put me in touch with Ting and they, put, you know, tried to, and they coordinated that interview and, and that's how I, I met with, with that particular company. But nothing, not, no big clients, no big marketing Linux campaigns just yet. Although that's definitely, uh, there's definitely potential for that. I mean, that's something that Tom Taylor said to me as well. And when we when we chatted about this, uh, that there is a, a, a loop that's possible with advertising. That eventually, you know, those those businesses could um, see how much traffic they're getting from Amazon and then market and and advertise on the Amazon website. So. And finally, uh, speaking of the of the of the assumed phone that they're going to be announcing on the 18th, is there any connection with the mm -hmm. timing here? I mean, this is just right before they presumably announce a phone. This has been an unusually busy year for Amazon. I mean, I've only been covering the company about three months, and I, it seems that the pace of of launches and the pace of new products has really accelerated um, this year. Uh, I, in terms of a connection between the recurring payments and the mobile phone that's uh, reportedly going to be unveiled on June 18th, you know, they definitely tie into one another. The phone will help them with mobile payments, which is an area that everybody is, is exploring and, and really looking into. There's some reports out there that Apple has been hiring payments experts to, to look into this as well. And so it, it, it's, definitely connected and, and tied and builds off of one another. So, and that's something that Amazon likes to do. Um, well, that's that makes a lot of sense. And of course, they have lots more devices, TV uh, boxes and tablets as well. Well, I want to thank you, Absolutely. Deepa, for coming on Tech News today and telling us about this story. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Deepa Satharaman 
is at Reuters.com and also on Twitter. And I'm going to spell her Twitter name, D-S-E-E-T-H-A-R-A-M-A-N. Well, in just a sec, we're going to tell you about how much cybercrime is costing the world. It's probably more than you think. But first, I want to tell you about Citrix ShareFile. ShareFile is the way to share documents on the Internet. I'm old enough to remember back in the days when it was safe to just put an attachment into an email message and send it off onto the open, wild Internet. And, you know, you're pretty much going to be okay. Well, those days are long gone. It's a terrible idea to have a, a file of any security or sensitivity to be out there as a simple attachment to email. There are other reasons for using ShareFile as well. Uh, if you have a very large file, uh, again, if you have a, a file you don't want anybody else to see, or if you have a file you want to share with people and you want to have intelligence about that file, information based on who's downloading it and when, then ShareFile is the place to go because what they do is instead of sending an attachment, you send a secure link and the file itself is safely and securely held in the cloud. And when they download it, if you choose, you can be notified that the person has downloaded it. And you can set all kinds of restrictions on its downloading as well. For example, you can say, okay, this is only downloadable once, or this is downloadable five times, or this is downloadable only for one week and then no, it's no longer available. And then you can be notified that it's been downloaded and then contact the person and say, hey, I know you got the file, so let's talk about what's going on. It's really an amazing service. Some people use it because of the file size, um, uh, the lack of restrictions on file size. Some people do it because it's so secure. I like to use this service for all my attachments simply because it's so easy to use and so pleasant to use. It's a very beautifully designed site uh, that I just use it for all files no matter. And I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to think about whether the file is too big or whether it uh, you know, a, 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 a has financial information. I don't even worry about it. I just use ShareFile for everything. So sign up today for our 30-day free trial. No obligation at all. Just go to sharefile.com. Click the microphone at the top of the homepage and enter TNT. Remember, visit sharefile.com and type in TNT. Cybercrime costs the world $475 billion, billion with a B, per year, give or take $100 billion. That's according to a new report published today. Danny Yadrin covers cybersecurity for the Wall Street Journal, and he joins us to explain what's going on with this story. Welcome, Danny. Hey, thanks for having me. So can you tell us about this report, who published it, and, um, and how are they defining cybercrime? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so for one, this is the second uh, joint report put out by McAfee Intel Security Unit and um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., a very uh, widely respected uh, think tank out there. Uh, Jim Lewis, a former State Department official who helped write this report, um, you know, often advises the White House and Congress on cyber matters. Um, and then how, you know, what did they include in cybercrime? As you said, you know, there's a pretty big range from 375 billion globally to 575 billion globally. And that includes, you know, financial data theft. If you think of uh, cases like Target, um, intellectual property theft, um, you know, you're stealing a, you know, food company secret formula or defense contractor's secret formula um, and other of that nature. And, you know, how do you measure that? We're having a little that, glitch with Skype there. Sorry about that. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Lindsay. I was just going to ask if that number seems potentially small. I mean, I, I noticed that your report said that it's a little bit, even, even the study sort of notes it's a little bit hard to tell um, what, is going to fall into this bucket and what is it and, and and some companies don't report cyber cyber crime do you is it your suspicion that it might be bigger than this and that there's so many individual cyber crimes i mean to me half this this basically says that half as many um, half as much money is lost to cyber crime as to is to counterfeiting and to me that seems low well there's two things there one yes it definitely is low and as you know the authors of the report notice you know they, they tried to keep this conservative in the past. You know, U.S. officials would often throw around the term, you know, one trillion lost every year to cybercrime or the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. You know, it's a great soundbite, but it was a little hyperbolic. The other thing that's changed in the calculation, and, you know, this is totally debatable, um, but, you know, cybercrime is not a zero sum game. You know, if you steal intellectual property from me to go make, you know, a jet fighter, you know, more cheaply, you know, you can't just count the, the research I've lost. There's another company in another country 
um, that is getting some sort of advantage out of that. So you have to adjust for that is what they're arguing. The other point is that the uh, calculations about lost revenue from intellectual property theft uh, are always kind of suspicious to me because it kind of assumes that if some company in China makes a fake iPhone and sells it as a real iPhone and the person buys it for $80, the assumption implicit in this is that if there wasn't a counterfeit, they would have gone and spent $600 on a real iPhone. In other words, the value of an iPhone is what has been lost. That is clearly not the case with a lot of uh, counterfeiting and, and stolen intellectual property, is it? So that, that's that's kind of a and, and by the way, in this report, I believe that the biggest driver in the in 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 the biggest monetary value of cybercrime is stolen intellectual property. So oh, yeah. how do they how do they calculate the fact that you know when somebody uh, steals intellectual property that in fact they wouldn't have in many cases purchased the original. Well, and that's the thing, and that's why the number may, um, you know, seem a little low to some at first is, you know, they did a lot of consulting with intellectual property lawyers. And, you know, there is no hard and fast rules for how you calculate this, but but they try to temper those expectations. Because as you said, you know, uh, the person who was going to buy the $80 iPhone probably wasn't, didn't have the money for the $600 version. Exactly. Now, I've, I've heard associated with this report that something like 40 million people in the United States have had their personal information stolen within the last year. That seems like an awfully high number. It is, but if you think about it, I mean, there were um, 40 million uh, credit and debit card numbers uh, just stolen from Target last year. So you can, you know, you can extrapolate some there. Um, and you if you add up, you know, even just the number of retail breaches, and many of which, you know, made nowhere near as much news as the breach at Target Corp, you can see how you, you might get to 40 million. And then you have breaches, you know, like the one in Adobe, um, where uh, last year, you know, email addresses, um, home addresses, you know, sometimes payment card information, uh, that was all taken um, by people looking for uh, people's personal credentials to then log into their banking websites. Does this, does this study account for, you know, sort of small, very small theft. Is there any calculation for that for the individual person down the street who steals your mail and then hacks into your bank account? Um, they, they try to, but it's all, I mean, at that point, you're sort of based on math and, you, and you're making some sort of assumptions. You know, I, I had a, a pretty long conversation with Jim Lewis, one of the authors of, of this report last week. He said that was one of the biggest challenges is, is that his job would be to call up government officials both in the US and abroad and basically mine them for all data you know they have on this um, but a lot of that's based on self reporting i um, you know only what the government has visibility on um, you know the fbi uh, actually keeps stats on you know small grade cybercrime through its ic3 task force but again that's all self reporting and you know i don't know about you folks but if, if i you know had credit card theft or something like that, I don't know if I would call up, you know, the small division of the FBI and let them know that I had a problem. I would just file it with my police department. So I, I guess it depends on whether or not that I, in fact, I have, <laughs> I think it depends on whether or not that ends up bubbling up to the FBI. And I, I think sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And so it, it's not consistent on that level. And that's, you know, that is certainly a big challenge with all of this. Well, Danny Yadrin, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today and explaining this report. It's it's clearly the the big uh, the big thing here is that we really don't have a lot of specifics on this, but it's uh, it's something to keep in mind and it's good for us all to be aware of what is going on on the huge global level. Exactly. I mean, you know, as, as the report author said, it's a start. You have to start somewhere. Exactly. Well, thanks again for coming on. You can find Danny Yadrin at wsj.com and also on Twitter at Danny Yadrin. Well, so. a, all right. A Swiss programmer named Frederick Jacobs discovered an interesting privacy feature over the weekend in Apple's upcoming iOS 8. The operating system generates random MAC addresses from your phone. A MAC address is a unique identifier on any device that connects to Wi-Fi. And in recent years, companies have been harvesting the MAC addresses of smartphones to track behavior of shoppers and even people walking down the street. Uh, Lindsay Turrentine, this is, a, this is kind of a cool little feature that they didn't make a big deal of. But basically what they're doing is that as your iPhone is hunting for Wi-Fi connections, you know, your average phone just sends out the MAC address and then the... The, the, the routers can actually harvest that information and see, you know, oh, this person is coming back every day or this person spent four hours in the store. They don't know who it is, uh, but they can harvest that kind of information. 
what's happening here is that the iPhone uh, running iOS 8 is sending out random MAC addresses, so the uh, the routers are confused and can't really say for sure uh, what's going on with any individual user. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool from a security standpoint, and I think it'll make a lot of people feel less like they're being watched everywhere they go. The thing that occurred to me, though, is that this may have something to do with Apple's iBeacon technology, which they're, you know, is slowly showing up all over the place. And I'm going to assume that iBeacon technology is still going to know who you are and that that's kind of an advantage for Apple. Yeah. Well, that's one of the trends is that companies protect you from other people having your personal information while they keep it themselves. Facebook, uh, Facebook's new ad system is like that, where they basically allow allow users to sort of log in to apps without giving their personal information while Facebook itself is keeping the personal information for themselves. I wrote an article about a company called Presence Orb in the UK that was using MAC addresses to track people. And they were putting uh, routers that could detect MAC addresses into trash cans on the street, into uh, into the windows. They, they wanted to see who was coming up to the window to look at their windows display, how long they were sitting there looking. And they were tracking traffic around town and selling this service to retailers uh, as a way for them to get additional information. And then and then if they can convince the user to actually log into their Wi-Fi address, they can say, okay, now we can put a name and some other information to that MAC address. And then once they have that in the future, when they detect that same MAC address, they know who it is. You know, and this is a growing business, and and the trash cans I mentioned have been shut down, and there was a big outcry, and, and the sort of the whole thing went south. But the company is still in business offering services like that. And, um, you know, I think this this is a, a part of a theme that we saw emerge at Apple's WWDC, where they are essentially saying, okay, Google is the harvest all your information company. We're going to protect you from the harvesting information to a certain extent. And I think that's an interesting position for Apple to be in. Well, I think it's it's a really interesting position, and it's also advantageous to Apple to to be like you said, sort of the shepherd of your information. Um, this is big money, right? I mean, the knowledge of where you are and what your patterns are has just on the internet has sort of made the entire advertising industry online change, right? People know where you you, you get cookied and followed around the internet, and your patterns predict what kinds of ads you're going to get, um, and so. Everyone's trying to translate that into the real world, and um, and Apple certainly probably wants to own that portion um, of the of the market. And then you know we know that Amazon is coming out with their payment services and their their potential phone. Um, so you can sort of see that Apple will, would want to keep your MAC address or your your identity in their walled garden because it's it potentially good for you and potentially very good for them. Yeah, definitely. Well, it turns out that Microsoft might build Connect or something like Connect into future Windows phones. The Verge's Tom Warren reports that a future phone codenamed McLaren may have sensors that enable in-the-air gesture control for the phone. And Lindsay Turntine, this reminds me of the, of course, the Amazon rumors for the Amazon phone that we're going to be hearing about very soon, uh, which has sensors in it that, to detect various things. Although, from what I understand from this report, this is based on in-the-air gestures. For example, you can wave your hand to get rid of a, an SMS, just wave it over the phone. And, and some really subtle, cool things. For example, you, you, if the phone's ringing, you hold it up to your ear, and this sense, these sensors in the McLaren phone would be able to detect that it's your ear that it's close to, and uh, by detecting that would simply answer the call. You don't have to push a button. You don't have to do anything. Just hold it up to your, to your ear. It could uh, uh, enable you to just put the phone on a, uh, on a desk or something, and that would enable the speakerphone. Uh, it would mute when you hold your hand over it or p hold it against your chest. And so this could be kind of a, um, uh, it could it could give us all kinds of conveniences, whereas the Amazon phone is apparently about 3D, to know where your eyes are, to know where your face is, so it can show you 3D images without uh, goofy glasses. But uh, I really like this trend of using some pretty serious technology and sensors to give you these small everyday conveniences. I think it's it's potentially really cool, and some of this exists right now, right? Samsung current high end Samsung phones will let you wave to answer and um, and perform some of those other features. If you hover your finger over uh, a link or an image, it, it'll expand the image. Um, I was talking to Jessica Dolcourt, who works for CNET and is an expert in in phones and all of this personal technology, and she was she was saying that one of, it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves because. 
it is difficult to do this. I mean, connect with Connect and Connect Technology, Microsoft is perhaps in the best position to do it, but it's very hard to know the difference between an intentional gesture and an unintentional gesture, right? I mean, if you imagine how many times you have your phone sitting on your desk and you, you, you know, gesticulating and um, wave your hand over it, it'll be interesting to see how intentional your movements need to be and how seamless that is. Um, because you may pick up your phone to perform any one of a number of functions and, and who knows what's going to happen, right? Will it, will it know what your intentions are? I can't wait to find out. I think it's yeah. really interesting. And of course, Nest got into trouble recently. They, uh, they have a smart smoke detector, which uh, if it goes off, accidentally, let's say you just burn the toast and the smoke detector goes off, you can just wave your hand underneath the smoke detector and it goes, it turns off. Uh, and what they discovered was that, um, you know, running and screaming through the kitchen when the house is actually on fire can be perceived as waving your hand to turn it off and then the alarm goes off and everybody dies in the fire. So that that's not good. So, no, <laughs> so, it's, you know, like that's, that's the, that's what we're talking about here. It's difficult to tell when you mean like, hey, stop, stop beeping at me. And when you mean, oh my gosh, I've got to get the smoke out of the kitchen. Although, you know, I tested that product and I actually found it particularly difficult to get it to shut off by waving. So there's a sweet spot there that I think is really difficult to identify. Yeah, definitely. Well, artificial intelligence software has finally passed the Turing test for the first time. The Turing test uh, is passed when 30% of judges believe an artificial human is actually a real person after having a typed conversation with the software. This event happened Saturday at a Turing test competition at the University of Reading in the UK. The software is called Eugene Gustman and interacts as a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. Judges grill the artificial boy about what he likes, about his family. His dad happens to be a gynecologist. And the software convinced <laughs> the judges that he was a real person, well, at least convinced uh, more than 30% that he was a real person. This is the first time in an official setting like this that software has convinced skeptical judges that a machine or software is actually a real person. And maybe if uh, the software can find a fairy godmother, he could become a real boy. <laughs> Just like the Velveteen Rabbit. Could be. Someday he'll be real. I, this is not very, uh, it's not a very tech comment, but what, the thing that I found most entertaining about this piece, and it's, it's frankly an amazing, it's amazing that this happened, but I also thought it was interesting that a 13-year-old boy was named Eugene. It doesn't, yeah. seem, I, I, it doesn't seem like the name of a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, bells should have been ringing at that point. That's right. <laughs> Wait a minute. What did you say his name was? Oh, yeah. I totally don't know. Maybe it's really popular in Ukraine. <laughs> I, also, I also suspected, and again, this is, this is unfair to the creators of this computer program, uh, who are geniuses, clearly, but I suspected that it's cheating a little bit to have both somebody from another country, a Ukrainian, and also a 13-year-old boy. I mean, 13-year-old boys are capable of saying anything. They, they tend to be random, you know, uh, in, in there. I mean, I, I, have, I have two boys who were once 13. I know that it's sometimes hard to tell whether they're machines or, or, or human. So and That's true. My, yeah, ten, true. my almost 11-year-old boy, pretty much you could convince uh, me that a computer is him by simply talking about video games without listening to my response. Right. Exactly. Like, he'll just continue to talk about a video game regardless of whether I say something like, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> that's hilarious. So, you know, that, that's all I, it takes. I think what you need to tell him is slash unsubscribe. Yeah. And then he'll understand. <laughs> he'll not say anything. Good parental advice. There yes. <laughs> Jason, how? Yeah, Jason, so you've taught me a lot. <laughs> no, this is really, this is, um, I, I, this is amazing, really. I mean, despite all of the, the joking that we're we're doing, the fact that, 30% of the time people could not tell that yeah. the person answering them was a machine is um, it's frankly, it's kind of terrifying. Yeah. It's astounding. And, and of course this is a, a test uh, not of cognition by machines, but simply the ability of, of software to be able to fool humans with uh, a series of, of tricks and so on. So it, it, this doesn't indicate a, a mental capacity of a 13 year old <laughs> Ukrainian boy. It's it's merely a special purpose software designed to make you feel like it's a real human being. Impressive as it is, it doesn't in indicate the rise of the machines and that a, a, a race of 13-year-old of Ukrainian uh, overlords <laughs> are going to take over the world and launch Skynet and all that stuff. Well, <laughs> fascinating. By the way, the, the, the Alan Turing invented the Turing test in 1950. 
Wow. Well, today's Google Doodle was created by an 11 year old girl. This is a this is a, a show that kind of has a lot of kids in it. Audrey Zhang won the seventh annual Google Four comp Google competition, beating out more than 100,000 other entries. Her drawing is called Back to Mother Nature, and it shows a water purification system that looks like a submarine with wings. Google's professional doodlers turned her drawing into an animation for the Google.com site, and you can see it today by going to Google.com. Zhang won a $30,000 college scholarship, plus Google donated $50,000 to uh, education support at her own school, and also $20,000 in Zhang's name to the Charity Water Project, which provides clean water to schools in Bangladesh. And if you're watching the video, you can see uh, you can see her working on a really expensive-looking computer uh, to create uh, the animated version of her oh, that drawing. That's cool. So it's I pretty it. wild stuff. Yeah, there is the winning entrance entrance right there. And uh, when she goes to college and tells everybody how she paid for it, they're not going to believe it. That is pretty cool. Well, that is the tech news today. Lindsay Turntine, I want to thank you for coming on as guest co-anchor. I really appreciate having you on, and it was great having you on Twit. I did my first Twit the other day, uh, last weekend, almost a little more, more than a week ago, and you were awesome on that show. Um, thank and you. And I had a lot of fun there. Always really fun, I, and I loved coming to see the studio. I've never been there. It was, it was a fun time. Well, hope to have you back very, very soon, and thanks again for coming on today. Thank you. All right, you can subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT and also on YouTube, youtube.com slash Tech News Today. And please follow us on Twitter, Tech News Today TV. And we want to hear from you. Comment on Twitter or Google Plus using the hashtag Tech News Today or send us an email at TNT at twit.tv. You can also leave us voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, with Sarah Lane tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.